So when liquids boil or evaporate, they enter kind of this in-between state that causes what we call vapor pressure. So when molecules leave the surface of a liquid and enter the gas phase, they end up creating a pressure because gases cause pressure. And that pressure is going to push down onto the surface of the liquid. As a result of pushing down the surface of the liquid, it actually prevents other molecules from evaporating. And so in order for something to boil off, it has to not only gain the energy to break its intermolecular forces, but it also has to overcome the vapor pressure on top of the liquid surface. And it also has to do with kind of the surface area of the liquid. That's why if you have a glass of water and you leave it sit on the table, it's going to take a long time for that to evaporate. And that's because it's got a very, very small surface area. However, if you take that glass of water and pour, pour it out across the entire table so that it fills out that entire area, it's going to evaporate a lot quicker because it's a larger area. And as you increase the temperature, you increase the amount of gas, so you're going to increase the uh, vapor pressure as well. And vapor pressure and evaporation are both higher in substances that have weak intermolecular forces. So if something with, has weak intermolecular forces, that means it's pretty easy for it to enter the gaseous state. If it's easy for it to enter the gaseous state, that means it's going to have a high vapor pressure. So if we think of something like hexanes, which is a liquid that has a very, very uh, weak intermolecular forces, only has London dispersion forces, its vapor pressure is going to be very, very high, and it's going to evaporate very, very quickly. So in an open container, something evaporates, that means it turns into a gas and it actually just floats away, so eventually it disappears. However, if you close a container, it will enter a vapor pressure equilibrium. So that means part of the liquid just naturally sitting there is actually going to evaporate and turn into a gas inside the bottle. So even the water is going to do this. Water evaporates and it'll break off and kind of float around in there. However, once the pressure builds up enough, it's actually going to fall back down into liquid and we enter a state of equilibrium where it's evaporating and condensing at the exact same rate. And so the pressure in there, you know, vapor pressure of water, if this is at 25 degrees Celsius, we about 23.8 millimeters of mercury, or that's 23.8 uh, torr. But if we heat this up, so I mean, think about this, you should be able to picture it just by closing your eyes. If you were to heat up this container with liquid, what would happen to the pressure inside there? Uh, it would increase. We all know that already. And the reason it's going to increase is because if we look at our equilibrium here, if we add heat to it, it's going to shift away from that heat. That's Le Chatelier in action right there. And so it's going to shift this way and, oh, what do you know, a gas. So if we are shifting it that way, we're generating more gas. Therefore, it's going to increase the rate of evaporation and it's going to increase the vapor pressure above the liquid. And as it turns out, water at 90 degrees Celsius, so still below boiling point, has a vapor pressure now of 526 millimeters of mercury. That's up from 24 at uh, 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that vapor pressure that's forming above the liquid also has to overcome atmospheric pressure. So remember, we don't really feel it, but there's air all around us. And that air is pushing down on us with 15 pounds per square inch. And liquids need to overcome that too. So when they try and boil, they need to push up against that air so they can turn into gases and float away. So a boiling point is the point where vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. So if the atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds per square inch, boiling point of water would be the point when the vapor pressure of water also reaches 15 pounds per square inch. This is why if you've ever watched a pot of water trying to boil, you'll see the bubbles forming at the bottom and maybe some will break off and start to rise, but then none of them form on the top. So those bubbles never make it to the top, and it's because at that point, atmospheric pressure pushing down on your pot of water is still holding that down. So even though the water is going to evaporate inside there, once it gets to the surface, bam, the earth keeps it down. This is also why water boils at lower temperatures at higher elevations. Because if we go up into the mountains, you're going to have less air stacked on top of you. So the atmospheric pressure drops. And as a result, if the atmospheric pressure is lower, it's going to require less energy or less vapor pressure to overcome it. So if the atmospheric pressure drops to 10 pounds per square inch, you're only going to need 10 pounds per square inch of vapor pressure. And here you can see, so at sea level, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. As you move up, so Boulder, Colorado, the Mile High City, water's going to boil there at 94 degrees Celsius. And as a result, things just tend to take longer to cook. Uh, Mount Everest, 70 degrees Celsius. Take a long time to make a pot of spaghetti on the top of Mount Everest. So stronger intermolecular forces require more energy to break free from the liquid state, to enter the gaseous state. And so if it requires more energy to break free, 
then it's going to require more energy to cause the vapor pressure to equal the atmospheric pressure. So if none of those liquid molecules can break off and turn into a gas, there's no way to increase the vapor pressure. And so you've got to keep putting in energy until it hits that state. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of some different substances, their intermolecular forces, and their, their boiling points. So argon, for example, only dispersion forces, it's going to boil at negative 186 degrees Celsius. So those dispersion forces doesn't take much to hold them together, so a little bit of energy well below room temperature. Uh, we move up to something like this right here is hexanes. So hexanes uh, is going to have a boiling point about 80 degrees Celsius. And so only dispersion forces there. It's going to require a little bit less energy than water does in order to break it into the gaseous state, have enough vapor pressure to overcome atmospheric pressure, and bam, it's going to boil off. And of course there's water with its hydrogen bonds and its dispersion, boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, which if compared with the others, that's a fairly high boiling point. There's also another uh, phase change called sublimation, and this is when solids evaporate directly into a gas. So instead of going to a liquid, then to a gas, they just do essentially the same thing. So they create a vapor pressure, overcome atmospheric pressure, and float away. However, since uh, the intermolecular forces are stronger in solids than they are in liquids, usually vapor pressures are fairly low with solids, so ice has a very, very small vapor pressure. But substances that have weak intermolecular forces are going to have higher vapor pressures with their solids. So something like carbon dioxide, which is a linear molecule, so it's only going to have the uh, dispersion forces, has a pressure or a vapor pressure of one atmosphere at 25 degrees Celsius. Hey, one atmosphere, that's standard pressure in a room. So this is why dry ice sublimates, goes directly from a solid to a gas, because at 25 degrees Celsius, it's vapor pressure already equals the atmospheric pressure. It doesn't need to go to a liquid. <laughs> you think ice has a low vapor pressure? If you want to talk about low vapor pressures, talk about ionic solids. Those suckers have really strong intermolecular forces, and so their vapor pressures are going to be extremely, extremely low. If you want to turn these guys into a gas, you got to give them a lot of energy.